the majority of internal work, one way or another, involves us having to place our awareness, a part of our attention, onto an object, and generally that object is within the body. That's usually the case. Sometimes that object is a, an, an image or a symbol within traditions that are more visually based, perhaps, than the one I teach, rather than a, a very somatic body-based system like this one. But generally, the majority of cases, that object is within the body. So, for example, that object might be the breathing, might be the breath. That's a common run, right? Or the object might be the body itself, the form of the body. Or perhaps the object is a dantian. Okay, we have these various objects. So when we use the term object for practice, this is what we mean. What is the attention or the awareness interacting with for our practice, for our work, right? So, if you have a mechanical method, a qigong method, like uh, whatever, anchor in the breath, say, it's a common one that I would imagine you've done plenty of. If you have a mechanical method like anchor in the breath, we have something to do, okay, which is we're just breathing and paying attention. That is our instruction. As well as the mechanical method, we then also have the interaction between our awareness and the object or whatever it is we've been told to put our awareness onto. This really is what's going to make the difference as much as anything between whether that exercise works or not, whether that exercise is successful or not. We've all been in classes where our mind has wandered, definitely. Maybe you've been in a Qigong class where you're doing a moving exercise and you're doing whatever you're supposed to be doing, but your mind is fascinated by what's on the wall or what you're doing tomorrow or what the person next to you is getting out of the practice or whatever. We've all had those kinds of experience where the mind is wandering. And as soon as the mind is wandering, it is off of the object of our practice, then of course the efficiency of the practice drops. It goes down uh, drastically, like it, it, the efficiency of the exercise is, is greatly reduced just because we're not paying attention. Because we have to have the mind and the body to interface. But an issue that people have that's coming up time and time again is as soon as they put their mind inside their body, they go into a state of pain or discomfort or tightness or shock. It's like a great discomfort seems to arise from many people when they put the mind inside the body. No matter how passively or gently or caringly, whatever you want to call it, the, the mindset is, as soon as the mind and the body interact with one another, then a problem arises. Okay? On, for some people, on a, more, on a less problematic level, I guess, what they get is tightness. Maybe the diaphragm becomes tight or the lungs become constricted. So the more that they pay attention to the body, the more constricted the, the lungs become, which is not nice, but again, it's not the, the be all and end all. It's not too much of a worry. But then, well, unless the breathing is completely restricted, <laughs> that's a problem if you can't breathe. But then what happens is sometimes you get more extreme reactions where people put the mind into the body and then what do they get? They get sort of fear arising or um, old traumas come into the surface that are problematic for them, that are stressful. It becomes difficult or sometimes extreme pain arises in the body. Some people put their mind in their body and it actually causes their energy just to drop, just to run out. Like they just become exhausted by putting the mind in the body, their energy is gone, which is obviously the opposite of what is supposed to be happening, right? You would assume when the mind and the body touch one each other, there's a more efficient sort of functioning of the body on an ener energetic level, but that's not everybody's experience. So we need to learn to deal with that factor because even though a small percentage of people might be having that issue, it is quite prevalent. There's enough people on the planet for a small issue to still <laughs> affect a large enough number of people. But also, it still might be happening to a lot of us, but on a more gentle level. Maybe one that doesn't feel so problematic, but still there is some kind of negative impact that is being had by our mind and our body interacting with one another. Yeah? Maybe, have you seen this yourself? Uh, or heard of this? Or seen it in classes if you teach? Or maybe you've had it yourself? I don't know. Yeah, some of you are nodding. Yeah. Mm. Essentially, whenever we're going to put our mind into the breath or into the body, okay, most of you I've spoken to this about this before, right? We have, uh, we have the three types of intention, okay? So I won't discuss them in too much detail because we've already talked about these a lot and, and I think most of you are familiar with them, but just in brief to, to recap. Three types of intention and then attention, okay? Three types of intention and then attention. So the first of our intentions would be conscious intention. 
that which we're in control of, the intention we are doing deliberately. Okay, we are intending. So I want this to happen, okay, or I think this is going to happen, or this is my aim from this happening, or I'm going to imagine this, or I'm going to visualize this, or I'm going to guide this or force this. All of those things would be conscious intention, right? And conscious intention is obviously a very important part of life. But in the majority of cases, we want that taken out of the way for what we're doing, for our practice. So if I'm paying attention to my breath, I don't want conscious intention. Because conscious intention is on the opposite end of the spectrum from attention to me. So we are not listening. So therefore, that means I cannot change my breath, right? I cannot change my breath. I cannot think... I'll breathe into the ribs, and then I'll breathe into the back, and then I'll breathe to, I don't know what, whatever, uh, the pelvic floor, and I'll breathe and stretch the diaphragm, and I can't do this. I can't have that intended change to my breathing and really expect it to evolve as it needs to, because one of the kind of rules, certainly with Taoist work, is that things evolve when they're given attention. When we give them the nourishment of paying attention to them, it will grow. So we have to take that intention out of the way, the conscious intention. Then the second level of intention is subconscious intention, right? Subconscious intention. So subconscious intention is your personality. That's primarily what it is, yeah? So when you carry your attention into a process, maybe my breathing, my attention is there, I am paying attention. What you will bring with it, we all will, to a certain degree, is subconscious intention. So this means that we have nuances and flavors and differences between each other with regards to our emotional makeup and our psychology and even the events that are going on around us on a day-to-day -day basis or, or what mood are we in that day. And all of these things will be carried across to a certain degree with your attention. So if, for example, you're having the most marvelous day you've ever had, maybe this is the happiest day of your life and then you put your attention onto your breathing process, you will probably get a different result from if you're having the worst day of your life where everything is going wrong and your life is falling apart and then you put your attention onto the breathing. One of those, <laughs> one of those two options, the good day or the bad day, is going to produce different reactions, right? And most of us have experienced this, that there are good days for practice and bad days for practice. Most of the time, this is to do with subconscious intention that is carried with your attention. So one of the skills for internal arts that takes a long time is to learn how to separate those two from one another so that you can be having the most amazing day in your life. Everything has gone right. It's like uh, a Disney music video. There's little birds flitting around the head and things like this. You're out in a little forest. Everything is marvelous. And then you uh, sit down and you do your practice. Okay. You should be able to have that. And then you should also have the worst day in your life, your wife leaves you, your job collapses or falls apart, your building is falling down around you and your pets just drop dead. And then you do the practice and you still get the same result on both days. That is ultimately what you're trying to get to. So essentially the outside factors are irrelevant for the practice because this means you've got to a stage where the subconscious intention is able to be got rid of. Okay, it's like it's, it's not there. I'm able to reside so much within my attention that I don't carry that with me. Do you understand that? Does that make sense okay? That's what you're trying to get, yeah? Now, obviously, that's not, not easy. <laughs> that's pretty difficult. So it's not like it's either there or it's not. There's, like a, there's a sliding scale, of course, isn't there? There's a sliding scale. So, of course, in the early days, maybe we always bring our life with us. We sit down for practice, angrily working on our meditation or whatever it is we're doing and then of course as we ease away from that level of subconscious intention towards attention that kind of separation is there a little bit a little bit of space is created and for me before we try to unify everything i think that separation is wise i think it's wise to be able to kind of compartmentalize okay i know people say oh don't compartmentalize don't separate your practice from life make sure your life and practice are one uh, it's a great idea but maybe make life and practice one when you've become better at taking the subconscious intention away a little bit. Maybe it's better to have a little bit of compartmentalization at first until the correct quality is there and then we can integrate it. That, that's my opinion. Because I think it's then better, uh, easier for us to, uh, to build a consistent practice. We're not affected too much by that subconscious intention. 
Hopefully, I didn't complicate that too much. I hope not. Hope not. So, obviously, for some people, the subconscious intention can be more problematic because if you are what uh, I don't know, chron chronically depressed, or chronically upset, chronically angry, I don't know, wh whatever the state. Okay. For whatever reason, maybe uh, maybe there's a direct effect, some kind of reason, a, a trauma, or maybe it's just a general state, maybe a chemical imbalance, maybe a hereditary, who knows, whatever the many reasons. That subconscious intention can be harder to let go of. It can be more difficult. It can be more tricky. So consequently, every time they practice, then it becomes detrimental. So if I'm depressed, very, very depressed, and I'm living in that state and I can't see a way out, and then I try to do my internal practice, Every time I practice, oh, I just get so exhausted. I just get wiped out and I get aches and pains in my body and I just feel negative. Well, obviously, that subconscious intention is harder to let go of, right? It's more of a problem. So we need to work with that. And that's a lot of the, the problem people are having with breathing practices. It's also part of the reason people get problems with things like mindfulness sometimes, you know, to be mindful of themselves but also bring with them all of this kind of mental baggage, okay? And of course, whatever quality the mind has will change the quality of the chi and change the quality of the body. Then the third kind of attention is unconscious, oh, intention, blah, blah, blah. The third kind of intention, I apologize, is unconscious intention. That stuff that you're not even aware of, not even slightly. <laughs> it's completely out of your awareness. So this can be something that is repressed, Okay, people can repress memories or repress traumas or maybe a trauma that they don't know they're carrying with their mind. So maybe they can even remember, okay, when I was six, this happened to me. It's normally something from when you're younger usually, but I wasn't aware that it was affecting me. So right now I feel happy-go-lucky in my life and everything is good. And then when I do the practice and I put my mind on the breath, I just feel oh, just uncomfortable, like I want to explode and all the nerves get tight and I feel oh, everything like in my body getting uncomfortable, but I don't know why. And this can be due to unconscious intention that is carried across, okay, from something that is stored deep within our past, usually. The smallest percentage of people with problems are from that category, but of course this one is very problematic, because how do you even deal with something that's unconscious? Something that's subconscious, you can make conscious <laughs> by applying your attention to the feeling, but something that's unconscious is very difficult to make conscious. So it is a tricky thing. Yeah. Do you understand all that? Does that make sense okay? Three times of intention, attention. So part of the skill that develops with time, because it's hard for us to do it like this, right? <laughs> Human brains don't work like that. That's not how we're, we're made. It takes time. Part of our skill is to learn how to get to the stage where our attention can be as pure as it can be. Okay, maybe not perfect. Maybe if your attention is a glass of water, maybe there's a few little... <laughs> drops of sand in it but we don't want the whole thing really muddy right we want to gradually start to move towards this pure attention to so our self our intention sits behind okay it is let go of uh, let go of a little bit now all of this maybe most of you know but I wanted to talk about it because it's something that keeps coming up People keep saying it, and often it's people I'm not teaching, actually. It's people that have um, seen public videos or read my books or whatever, tried something and then had this issue. And so clearly what that means is I think there's a lack of understanding in general. And I get it. I get why there'd be a lack of understanding. It's difficult. A lack of understanding to know that you can carry intention across with your attention without knowing it. Okay, it is, that is what is coming across. The self is here. You are putting this into into your attention and, and causing that problem, right? And it's a part of the reason why the difference between intention and attention takes a long time. It's one of those things that needs refining. It must be worked on and worked on and worked on and worked on. 